Good morning and welcome to a beautiful but nippy Sunday. Here we are again, sauntering. Praise the Lord. What a great day for sauntering. Eesh, let's move a little bit without crashing the seat. <laughs> so, Lord Jesus, we welcome you today. Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Invade our lives. <clears throat> Invade the space around us, Lord. Let there be a blast radius of your presence wherever we go. Lord, impregnate even our shadows that as they fall on people, there will be miracles of healing. And Lord, come on, this stuff I absolutely believe is up for us as well. So bring it on, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Fran, and good morning, Kathy, and good morning, Pete and Sally. Good morning, Sarah, Kev. Great to see you, gorgeous people. Um, chapter 12, we are on today. Good morning, John and Joan. Great to see you. I bet it's lovely and quiet on Portland this morning. Good morning, Michael. That is nippy up where you are. Um, so here we go. Acts chapter 12. Good morning, Angela. <clears throat> At about that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Four squads of soldiers. They were worried about him escaping again, weren't they? Um intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was being made to God by the church. Cool. Right, so not cool about James. Herod, this is a different Herod. This is the grandson of Herod who was around, Herod the Great, who was around um, in the time of Jesus' birth. Um, this is Herod Agrippa, apparently. I don't know these. I just read stuff and they tell me these things, um, apparently. And he um, was he was a puppet king, just like his grandfather. He was serving the Romans. Good morning, Eunice. Great to see you again. Good morning, Sandy. Caroline. Oh, got Caroline live this morning. Great. Good morning, Rosalind. Um, so I bet it's nice and toasty in in um, Delhi, Yunus. Um, anyway, so he he was a puppet king. He sort of depends on favour with the Romans and favour with the Jews, and he so he gets these Christians because he knows they're not popular with the Jewish authorities, and he rounds up James, who is the brother of John. The, Two Sons of Thunder, one of Jesus' closest companions, James, John and Peter, were always with Jesus, weren't they? Um, good morning, Emma and Jonathan. And they were on the mountain of transfiguration. They were with him when he went to heal the girl who'd been, who died. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> no, it's passed. Um, and uh, so he... He thought, let's round up these troublemakers. Let's kill them off. So he beheads James and get and sees how much favour that gives him. So he's like ingratiated himself with the Jews. So he thinks, I'll get Peter as well. He's a troublemaker and he's a noisy one. If I can shut him up, I'll be doing really well and I'll be eradicating this upstart sect that we can manage very well without. Um, so... He get they get Peter and they throw him in prison and they're not taking any chances. Last time he was in prison with John, an angel came and set them free. So this time they've got how many? Four squads of soldiers. And Peter, as we read on, is sleeping chained to two soldiers. So he's literally chained to a guy each side. <laughs> they're not taking any chances. But they're not reckoning on God, who is supernatural. And above all things, he's a, he breaks every chain. Come on, let's hear it for Jesus. So P 
Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. I love that. Earnest prayer. The, the sense there is they were stretching themselves. They were extending themselves like we might extend a muscle during exercise. They were kind of really extending themselves in prayer to God. Um, and verse six says, when Herod was about to bring him up, so bring him out on that very night. Peter is literally on the kind of last day, you know, the last night before his execution. Um, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. I mean, they're not taking any chances at all. One little movement from Peter and these big burly soldiers are going to wake up and boff him, you know, and settle him down again. Say, shut up. Whatever. Um, so, um, behold, that means look, an angel of the Lord, um, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. <laughs> it's like this angel's not for messing about. Apparently angels are not for messing about. They're pretty, um, formidable beings and he comes in boffs peter and says wake up get up quickly and you can imagine peter he's like in a daze oh it's another vision oh gosh i'm having a lot of visions these days whoa this is cool and so <laughs> the angel so the chains literally fall off his hands how come well this is an angel they're supernatural they don't even need the key they can just undo the thing just boom like that Anyway, awesome. Uh, so the chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. So like get some clothes on, Peter, and follow me. So Peter seems to be in a bit of a daze. I think he's in the, the sense, he, I think he believes he's having a vision. And in the vision before when he was up on the roof, he was quite passive. He was watching it and he's probably thinking, oh, Oh, a vision. Oh, what's happening? What's God saying to me now? And so, and it, the, like he's not really realising, come on, Peter, come on, get up, wrap your cloak on uh, around yourself. This is not the kill and eat thing where he didn't do anything. This is actually, come on, you need to be moving now. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Pages, whoopsie. He didn't know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second, the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord and they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel left him. That is incredible, isn't it? Opens, we used to sing, there's a river of life flowing out through me makes the lame to walk and the blind to see, opens prison doors, sets the captives free. There's a river of life flowing out through me. There was a river of life flowing out through Peter, but he had an angel with him as well. And angels can do any combination code, any lock, anything. They can open gates and do all kinds of stuff. And so Peter is now free. And suddenly the angels disappeared. So it seems as it's only when he's the outside, on the outside of this big iron gate that he realises, oh boy, I'm actually free. This is incredible. And so he's, he's, they went out along the street, along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and <clears throat> from all that the Jewish people were expecting. So he suddenly realises he's not going to be beheaded like his dear friend James, but actually he's got a lease of life and God has released him for a purpose to carry on the ministry that he was doing before. This is really interesting and it kind of makes us want to ask a question. Why did James get beheaded and Peter not? How come? How come, why for? This is my big question. Why did James get beheaded and Peter gets another crack at life? You know, and, and apart from the fact that Jesus had said to him, Peter, you know, when you're old, 
people will bind you and take you where you don't want to go. He actually prophesied that over Peter. None of Jesus' prophecies ever um, fell to the ground. They've all been fulfilled. And the ones that haven't yet are still in the pipeline and will be. Absolutely, certainly. And often Jesus' prophecies were fulfilled the very same day or the next couple of days. And this is no exception. So this, this prophecy over... But there's more than that. There's a sense that whenever God does a miracle, an intervention, it's strategic. It has a purpose. And we may never fully understand that purpose. But when God brings that deliverance and sets, you know, does the miracle, etc., that is strategic. And this is yet another demonstration to Herod, this jumped up puppet king who thinks he's so great that he's actually not that great. And actually the only authority he has has been given to him, has been allowed him by God because it's part of the delegated authority that God has given to the earth. And he has a very tough lesson to learn, but he learns it too late for it to be any use to him. Verse 12, so this is right about Peter. So when he realised this, i.e. when he realised he was actually free, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. So John Mark. Um, not Mary Mark. Um, where many were gathered together and were praying. So the, this house was known to be a house where the disciples might well be gathered and so Peter heads off there. He thinks a pretty good chance there'll be some believers there. But if not, I can get some food. They'll have me in. I can sleep the rest of the night and so on. So um, when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Now, we have a front door and that's the door to our house. But often in warmer countries, they have like a little courtyard, a little compound and there's a gate on the outside and you can't get inside the gate. So you can't get inside the house because you've got to get through the outer gate. And he knocks on the gate, he rattles the gate and dear Rhoda, I love this story. This is one of the most gloriously human stories of the Bible. It's absolutely classic. So when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognising Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it's his angel, whatever that means. But Peter continued knocking and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. Right, listen to this. Right, just if it's Peter's angel, what's the angel doing at the door without Peter? Do you know what I mean? He's failed in his mission if he was. <laughs> anyway, random thought. So the, why would the angel come without Peter? It's pointless, isn't it? So <laughs> anyway, so recognising Rhoda's voice, so he... he Peter's like, Rhoda, recognising Peter's voice. She got so excited. She thought, oh, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. Peter's here, Peter's here. Runs in and tells him, forgets to open the gate. And so Peter's still on the outside like, hello, <laughs> it's me. And they're saying, you're out of your mind. This is such a funny story because they're in there praying for a miracle. The miracle, meanwhile, has happened. And the product of it is standing at the door And they don't perceive it. I think we're like that sometimes. I think we carry on praying. Good on us. Well done for praying in the first place. And the miracle's already happened. I heard a fantastic story about a miracle of someone we prayed for the other day. Just the other day. I, I don't know how much of it I can share, but it is very, very exciting. Someone with cancer. And we prayed for them. Cancer on the, of the skin. And we prayed for them. And they'd been fast-tracked by the doctor for uh, surgery and so on. Go back a week later for a checkup before going for the operation and whatever procedure was going to be done. And the doctor says, oh, this is amazing. By some strange coincidence, your body has destroyed 95% of the cancer. <laughs> so we want to see the last 5% gone. But that's a really exciting story. And it's sort of 
miracle in the making but I love it when we're praying for something and it literally happens while we're praying and this is exactly what was happening here with um, Peter and so they say to, verse 15 they say to her you're out of your mind <laughs> great faith was among the brothers at this time you're out of your mind you made it all up <laughs> Um, but Peter continued knocking and when they opened they saw it was him and were amazed verse 17 but motioning to them with his hand to be silent he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and, and he said tell these things to James this is the other James this is now we're, this is the James who we get to hear about quite a lot more he is the brother of one of the brothers of Jesus a natural brother of Jesus one of his mum's ongoing children um, contrary to some schools of thought that suggest that Mary perpetually remained a virgin, um, that would have been a very strange and unusual marriage in those times. And I don't think that history um, bears that out. Certainly the Bible doesn't. This is So this James now, because obviously the other James has just been decapitated, bless him, that this is... So he says, tell these things to James and the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. So he didn't stick around. He didn't actually stop and have fried eggs for breakfast. He just was off. Verse 18. Now, when day came, there was no, no little disturbance. <laughs> no little disturbance. They were not a little surprised. They were very surprised. That's a kind of fancy way of saying they were totally amazed. This was, oh my, there was huge consternation. When the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. You can imagine everybody blaming each other. Well, it's your fault. You, were, you, you had one thing to do. Stay awake. And you remember, right, hold on. Let's, 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 let's read, read what happens. Um, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Verse 19, after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Um, I think that's Peter, actually. Peter went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So Herod has come with all his rage on down on these soldiers who were supposed to be looking after Peter and has had them executed. That was the normal punishment for sentries who were on sentry duty who fell asleep on their watch. And that's this is quite powerful because it's a, an illustration of what should have happened had the soldiers at Jesus's tomb actually fallen asleep. But because this was a concocted story by the high priests and so on, who said, look, tell everybody you fell asleep. If you're questioned, tell them you fell asleep. Well, everyone would have known that was made up because you were supposed to be put to death if you fell asleep at your post. And there was a, there's a story of um, a soldier who fell asleep at their post and Alexander the Great had them. I think this Alex may have been a Roman soldier anyway. They, they made a pile of all his belongings and stood him on it and set fire to it and burned him to death. That's the kind of brutal treatment you got if you were in the, you were in the army and you fell asleep while you're supposed to be doing your job. So uh, these soldiers who were guarding Jesus's tomb most definitely did not fall asleep. This was a made up story to cover the truth. But these poor guys who really hadn't done anything wrong at all were executed. That's a bit grim, isn't it? Interestingly, there is an there is a report there is a historical account of the execution of James um, by a historian called Eusebius. I think he was writing in the first uh, in the second century, um, and he said that the soldier who was to guard James, the brother of John, when it came to James's execution. He had become so convinced of the gospel through spending time guarding James that he said, I too am a Christian. And if he dies, I die. And they decapitated them both, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? What an incredible story. Right. Herod, verse 20. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, 
They asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. So this was out of the, I think this was on the sort of edge of the region. And there's like a political dispute going on. And these people come and they're angry. Um, and so they, anyway, they've come to Herod. Um, he's angry with them. And so he goes uh, to make a speech. And Josephus tells us that on the day of this speech, Herod turned up wearing an, a robe made of pure silver. I don't know how they managed that. They must have woven silver thread. And it, the sun was shining on Herod as he was speaking. And he literally radiated glory, the glory of the sun. And so this was quite a moment. So there was this political situation Herod's gone to address it um, and verse 21 it says on an appointed day Herod put on his royal robes with Josephus a Jewish historian at the time Roman Jew or Jewish Roman um, something like that uh, he put on his robe these robes were actually made of silver and he stands there and he addresses the people and he took his, on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration. That's a, like a speech to them. And the people were shouting, this is the voice of a god and not of a man. Well, he had some stooges in the crowd who were all cheering him on. Whoa, Herod, you're amazing. This is the voice of a god, not a man. Hold on. And immediately... 23 an angel of the lord struck him down because he did not give god the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last right let's just hold that thought herod he did not give god the glory you remember whenever the apostles or the servants of god in the bible um do something amazing and people are you know responding like whoa this is amazing they fall down at their feet to worship them they say, stop it. We're just people. You should not be, eat. don't do that. That worship belongs to God alone. Well, of course, Herod, he knew that. He, and yet he sucked it up because he was serving the God. Well, he was serving the devil who has always, always, always wanted the worship that belongs to God. And so Herod's heart was full of wickedness and horrid stuff. And in the end, it, he literally, an angel of the Lord comes, strikes him down, and he's consumed from inside with worms. And Josephus tells the story, too, that after a few days of being in real agony, he was just consumed and dies, you know. So anyway, so he had so literally that moment he's there speaking in there, giving him this adulation and worship. The angel comes, strikes him down, and then from that moment on, he's consumed on the inside with worms. Ah, oh, gross. And it's like a kind of a death befitting somebody who is consumed by their own importance, their own lust for praise and all that kind of stuff. And he did. it says here, Luke says really clearly... Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. The glory belongs to God alone. Um, so verse 24, in very intentional, stark contrast, Luke says, but the word of God increased and multiplied. So the tyrant Herod is struck down. All his posturing and whatever self-gratifying pose, if you like, and the murder of James. This has brought him precisely, absolutely nowhere. He has been confronted by the glory of God and is struck down now and dead. And yet the word of God increased and multiplied. I love that. That's two very interesting words because we can imagine something increasing. It's kind of like maybe, you know, we 
day by day people are added and so on. But this is not just increasing, this is multiplying. When something multiplies, it's like cell division. It grows exponentially, doesn't it? So um, one divides into two, two divides into four, and so on and so on. And it's like, whoa, four fours are 16, aren't they? And I can't remember it after that. But it's just amazing how it how it goes and so this was what was happening the church was the numbers the word of God was increasing and multiplying verse 25 and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem or some translations say to Jerusalem uh, I'm not sure it matters but it is it obviously did where they were going was important but to us it's not so not, not so life-threatening <laughs> and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. There we go. Wow, what an amazing story. Here's, here's a couple of lessons, really. Number one is there ain't no prison, there ain't no chains that God can't get you out of if you actually allow him to, if you want him to. And he, he's, he's the God who breaks every prison, every chain, every chain of addiction, every life-controlling thing. He can break those things, easy peasy. Um... No obstacle will stop us fulfilling what God has called us to do if we keep walking with him one foot in front of the other. And just interesting, even that Peter is not troubled. It's the day before, and the night before his execution, and he's fast asleep. He's like Jesus, asleep in the boat. He's learned to be content, to be rested, to be calm. He knows that if he's going to get his head chopped off, He's going to live forever anyway with Jesus. It's no big drama. He's not going to live forever in this body, in this form. He's got another destiny awaiting him and he's clear on that. So the, the possibility of actually encountering death, even a gruesome one, is not keeping Peter awake. So whatever's keeping you awake it probably, I dare to say, is not quite as bad as the possibility of being beaten in public and having your head chopped off. Forgive me if it is, but it's <laughs> for most of us, it isn't that. It's probably something like we've got a difficult day ahead of us tomorrow. So let us keep things in perspective. Let's remember the angel that can open the prison and just ask God to help us. He's a present help in a time of need. Right, okay, one more thought. Whenever you're doing well and people are giving you the glory, just keep wafting it up to Jesus. Yes, Lord, it's all about you. It's all about you, Lord. You deserve the honour and the glory and we throw our crowns down at his feet and we love him and worship him. Surrender our hearts to him. God bless you, gorgeous people. Have an amazing day. And God bless you in Delhi. Talk to you soon. See you tomorrow.